Our first guest today is regarded as one of the most influential pioneers in virtual and augmented reality and is widely credited with helping create the genre of immersive journalism. She was also on a panel discussion yesterday called Girl Culture, and she is showcasing a new VR project here at South By called Border Stories. Please welcome Nani De La Pena. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Good, thank you. Thrilled to be here. Awesome. So you come from traditional print journalism, the world of that, and you were a writer for Newsweek at one point. What attracted you from that part of journalism into VR? Well, throughout that whole process, I really was grappling with how do we represent things um, uh, that really give people a visual sense of being on scene, right? That's what mm -hmm. you do as a journalist. I'd done like cover stories on hour by hour crack, right? Where I was hanging out with in crack dens and trying to report from there and with families and with et cetera. So journalistically, you're always trying to put people on scene, but I never could quite get what I wanted to, to show people um, until I started getting involved with virtual reality. I had to teach myself to code to be a better C sharp coder. Mm. And then in uh, like 2010, I was in a lab in Barcelona and on my first full walk around VR experience. Um, and um, that moment of like being in this, it was, a, it was a lab in Barcelona and they were doing a piece on um, uh, bystanders and like whether in fact this whole Kitty Genovese story was true that the more people were there on scene, the more people you know, wouldn't do anything because they expect somebody else to do something. And so they built a VR piece that put you on scene at this, basically a bar fight. And wow. I remember being there and I remember just like tugging on the cable trying to get closer to the scene <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I can't ever put anybody out there anymore, they have to be in here with me. And two years later, after becoming a better C-sharp coder, begging, borrowing favors, using 700 bucks of my own money, we created Hunger in Los Angeles, which was the first VR piece at Sundance. And that kind of helped kick off uh, a lot of careers. Yeah, you've, I mean, you've been nominated and you've uh, been awarded quite a few uh, different awards over the years. It's really impressive. So if you were to define uh, immersive journalism, because I feel like you've kind of sort of discussed it in the way you entered into VR, but if you were to define immersive journalism, how would you do that? So I would say it's the idea that you can put people on scene so they can really understand the sights and sounds and even feelings of what it's like to be there. Um, so we put people literally at the scene of, a, of an explosion on a street in Aleppo in Syria with kids around to try to understand why do people become refugees. We put you inside with, with Frontline. We actually did photogrammetry of an actual solitary confinement mm -hmm. cell. So we put you in with a guy who spent four and a half years in that cell so you really understand you know, what it's like to be confined. And we've also, with again, Frontline and Nova, put you on scene where we recreated the actual uh, uh, glacier uh, retreating so you understand this big glacier. What does it mean for it to really go away? Very difficult things to understand unless you're there. Mm -hmm. I remember experiencing the piece you did around domestic violence, uh, which was, that was, I mean, that was you just gripping to be, to be experiencing that. Um, the word empathy comes up a lot in this space, and I was wondering what virtual reality could teach all of us about empathy. So storytelling teaches a lot about empathy, right? We see films, we see documentaries, we, um, uh, you know, go to connect. Um, and uh, virtual reality gives us a whole other level of uh, connection. Uh, to these type of stories. And when I talk about that, I mean it in a really serious way. When you're in a movie theater and something happens that's scary, you jump, right? Your body's along yeah. for the ride, yeah. right? Now you talk about VR where you're really connected through your entire body into a story. And that's what makes it sort of a more, can be a more powerful uh, visceral storytelling medium for putting people on scene. As my young son once said, was like, well, gosh, when you're there, you feel like it could happen to you too. What is your approach to starting a VR project? What grabs you, and then how do you go from there? So, honestly, the very first thing I do is I literally shut my eyes and I imagine my body in the space. And then I try to understand how I'm going to shape the story so it happens around me. I've had so many directors come to me and go, I want to make this piece, and then there'll be a close-up. I'm like, no, 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 no <laughs> close-up. Because you can't force people to, to look. So you have to think about what does it mean mm -hmm. for them to experience it rather than to see it. And I think that that's really, really important. And, you know, the audio is very important, um, but the way that you do the story is equally important. Because if you do things like, 
you know, zoom the camera forward and the person's still in the standing position, their eyes are saying, I'm moving, and their body's saying, I'm not going anywhere. And that disconnect between eye and inner ear can literally make people nauseous. So mm. I tend to stay away from that. Yeah, um, so that's actually a good segue into my next question, which is what are best practices for VR journalism specifically? So, you know, we're still figuring a lot of those out, right? I think that, that journalistically we have a nice long history of trying to grapple with issues of what do you show people, um, uh, uh, you know, how do you present story, but there's some things which we're, we're still figuring out. For example, in that solitary confinement piece, we brought a guy who spent four and a half years in that cell to LA and we shot him with videogrammetry on the 8i stage. Now, what is he going to wear, right? Is he going to uh, you know, be in his solitary confinement clothes because we're putting you in the cell with him? Mm -hmm. No, because that's going to convey that he's actually in the cell when we filmed him. Right. So we had to put him in a different kind of clothes. Now cut to the NASA scientist who we, we did photogrammetry of his research airplane and he wanted to wear his blue flight suit. And it was this question, but hang on, people are going to think we filmed you inside that plane. He's like, I don't care. I always wear the suit when I'm inside this plane and I want to be filmed inside with my suit on. So this difficulty of determining that I think is really important. Now, to me, the bigger questions about also subjectivity of experience that's come from is people wonder like, oh, you're putting people on scene. Aren't you responsible for their experience? And I'm not so worried about that. What I am worried about is that all cameras are now having, uh, are being uh, starting to capture our world with depth, all of our phone cameras, mm -hmm. right? Which means that what are we going to do when somebody does the bomb scene with depth? Are we going to let people step over the bodies? Mm. So those are the kind of issues to me I think are much more important for us to be grappling with in terms of best practices mm -hmm. and ethics. It's so interesting. I remember it was striking and it seems simple, but uh, with the former inmate in, in solitary confinement, so it was very clear to me that you had dressed him in his street clothes uh, when he was showing me around uh, in, in, the, in the facility, in, in the jail cell. Um, do you envision, so your, your company is called Emblematic. And do you envision your company becoming a virtual reality news network at some point? Um, no doubt. Yeah. Um, and we're working with a lot of different news organizations to help them also grow. Um, uh, our world is not going to stay flat. And, um, you know, in terms of the way we, you know, sorry, let me rephrase that. Our world is not flat. So our media is going to also reflect that. What do you mean by that? Well, when you look at a film right now, like if you're looking at that TV screen, man, you can never ever get closer. Even with your phone, you'll never get closer to it. But our real world, yes, exactly. Now you're getting closer to it, right? <laughs> like literally, physically, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're in that headset right now, in a, in a flat video, flat film, you'll never get any closer. Mm -hmm. But you just showed like the real world has got dimension. Mm -hmm. So all of our content's gonna move that way. I'm not saying we're gonna lose film any more than we lost radio, like think of the rise of the podcast. Of course. But uh, all the kids are growing up now are becoming adults and they've used to being able to move through space like Minecraft or games and they're used to having digital representations of themselves and they're gonna expect their education, their journalism, their entertainment, all that way. So that's one of the reasons we uh, created the project that's hosting Border Stories here today. Do you want to? Uh, I absolutely do, and we have time for that, so let's get to that. But I, I, love, okay. what, I love where you're going right now. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, with with, them, sure, with Emblematic and you seeing it as, a, as, a, as a, ultimately a network. Sure, because of course um, Emblematic is going to be one of the places that's going to distribute and deliver the volumetric content of the future. Um, we're already working on that um, currently, and we're, and we're partnering with a number of news organizations. We've had a lot of support from the Knight Foundation, mm -hmm. which intent is to try to make sure that journalism is thriving um, for the future. Um, to you know, It's pretty simple, right? Democracies thrive on having educated voters, and journalism really plays an important part of that. Um, and unfortunately, currently, trust in our institutions, including journalism, are at an all-time low. And um, uh, I think that not only do we see ourselves as a network of the future that provides really powerful and important educational content, but that we're going to play an important role in helping people regain trust in the way that they gain stories and hopefully uh, continue to support our democratic principles. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's emblematic. And I'm wondering what you think might be sort of the, the next uh, few years for immersive and VR journalism. Um, well, what's been amazing is how many people have embraced the medium to tell journalistic stories. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's been amazing. I, I get stopped all the time. 
uh, folks are making stuff. They want to show me, you know, yesterday was somebody on the history of women in flight. Um, like really amazing stories all being told in this medium. So I, I think it's going to be just as much as you're going to have a radio podcast or you're going to have your print journalism or you're going to have your web journalism, you're going to have your immersive journalism. How long before we can cut the cord off of the, uh, the goggles? So um, A lot of people want to know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, uh, your phone is going to become your goggles. Mm -hmm. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna stop wandering around looking like this, and you're gonna have your glasses on. And you're gonna be looking like that. And I would predict that within the next five years, we've five got five G happening. We have edge computing. So the way edge computing works is that the data is stored in the same way, like you have to get a tower right now to get the connection to get your streaming information on your phone. Well, edge computing sends the data straight to the glasses, so the glasses don't have to hold all that weighty processing power. So edge computing is going to send the data for you, and they'll be all over the place. So you don't have to carry your devices in a heavy way. So that's part of what will help make, you know, the whole ecosystem has to grow as we begin to be able to make this more sophisticated content. That's uh, really actually very exciting. Um, I'm in no way scared of any of that. I think it's just like such a cool, uh, I can't wait. Oh, it's going to have some bad too. But, but the everything good does. comes bad. The good comes bad. What is reach? So we're really excited about Reach. Reach is um, both a platform and a tool set for making volumetric spatial content. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, right now, if you want a really complicated photogrammetry scene where it's photo real, right, you have to become either a better C-sharp coder, learn Unity, you learn Unreal, have some engineers you can hire. Um, uh, it takes time, it's expensive. Well, uh, with Reach, is literally, I decided I was so sick of the pain for people. For me, I was going to solve the tool for other, you know, create a tool for other people to solve that pain. So it's just buttons. Oh, I need a terrain, and either you can use one that we have, or you can upload your own. Oh, I need to add an object. And it's literally just a simple button, drag and drop, right? And um, you can upload your own content, and you can capture people in three different ways. You can use a high-end volumetric capture. You can use depth kit uh, scatter uh, to capture in 120 degree with a with like an Xbox Connect camera, or you can just literally put up any color sheet and stand in front of it and shoot yourself and drop your flat video in there. But it feels volumetric because it tracks where the person is looking, um, and we have an auto thing that lets you key out the color. And then here's the best part: is we can distribute it just via the web. So you can look at it on your phone, you can look at it on a computer, or you just hit a button and you can look at it on a headset mm -hmm. and walk around. It is not flat. It is full volumetric walk around content like our real world. So a lot of people don't realize how much computing power and, and, and technical, technical expertise goes into the creation of VR. And it sounds, it sounds uh, pretty revolutionary for you to kind of like simplify some of the, post, some of the production of it. That's right. It's volumetric YouTube. Uh, idea that you have spatial YouTube, uh -huh. but we also provide you the tools to make it because we understand that this is a, this is a not an easy process for most people yet, and we're, we're really simplifying it. Um, I, we have time, but I want to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, so let's get to your latest project, Border Stories, which is here at South by. So Border Stories, um, we were working with Spectrum News, and they're really interested in exploring this medium for, for news telling and how to do it uh, quickly and easily. So um, we then uh, wanted to do something about, you know, obviously the border issues is one of the biggest stories of our day right now. So with a reporter from Spectrum News, we went and captured a couple places down at the National Butterfly Center and also did an interview with a young woman who used to cross every day into the U.S. Uh, to go to school. And the idea is not only do you get to kind of get a, a closer understanding of these communities that feel um, uh, disrupted by, uh, you know, the, the National Butterfly Center is facing a potential of losing 70% of its land mm -hmm. through eminent domain if they're just going to put a wall down it. And this young woman was talking about how normal it is for people to come across the border and go to school, right? Except for one day when she tries to go, uh, there's a big long train in the way, yeah. and she tries to go under, you see her and go the under. train yeah. starts to move, and you're under there with her, right? But all of that is distributed through the web. You could just poke on a, a link right now and watch it on that device, right? You don't have to have a headset on. Um, it's better if you have a headset on, but um, uh, the idea for Reach and Border Stories is to take this place and, and really get people to be able to see it anywhere. And the final component is we're capturing people here and letting them talk about how they feel about what's going on at the border and then drop themselves in one of those environments. That's what you're doing at South by Southwest. That's correct. People can capture themselves upstairs, be put into those scenes, 
right now, today, and, uh, and um, you know, talk about their own um, experiences, um, wishes, um, complaints, whatever it is, you know, to talk about Was there someone story. that you've seen uh, that caught your interest? Um, you mean in terms of who's been captured so far? Yeah, here at the festival. Yeah, gosh, uh, not, not yet, um, but I promise you I'll be sending you some links that you can publish <laughs> with the story if you want, or if people want to look at it. Yeah, no, that's I've been, very exciting. I've been running around, unfortunately, and my team has been there on, gro on the ground. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. I've got an amazing team. Can you imagine that I can just leave and they can take care of it? That's how good the emblematic group is. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm going around to doing things like this and try and talk to people about what we've made and where we're going with this. Um, uh, and I've been able to leave my amazing, amazing emblematic team to handle all those interviews. That's really exciting. Uh, another thing that you've been, uh, you participated in here at, at uh, South By was your, your panel discussion, Girl Power. Um, girl Culture. Oh, Girl Culture, excuse me. Um, Which girl, is girl Power is on the brain. Girl Power yeah. for Girl Culture. Yes, there you go. go. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Uh, in this past year, we've seen a big shift uh, for women in our culture across the board. Um, and in this panel, you talked about the evolving female voice. What were some of the takeaways from that discussion? Well, I just wanted to do two things. Girl culture is an amazing, um, basically, um, uh, group that's being run uh, by Lauren Greenfield. And what she's done is she's basically uh, determined to uh, go out and, you know, and working like an agency. And they're finding jobs for women. Mm -hmm. And they've picked a handful of very experienced women uh, to go out and compete against the jobs that are generally going to guys. Um, what, what industry is this? Uh, across things, across right? Across everything, okay. Yeah, across things. There's, um, and I know you've seen this girl power and this girl idea, right? But let me tell you about in tech, where in 2017, 2016, et cetera, only 2.5% of venture money went to women, right? And so what happened last year, our big Me Too year? It went down to 2.2%. Mm. And yet Business, Business Insider showed a study, very recently published a study, showing that the return on investment that that money that goes to women, it's actually they make more money. They make more dollars than the guys do, and yet we get less money. So in technology, it's really tough. So already uh, this agency, Girl Culture, is uh, starting to change that and shift that. They're getting uh, the ad jobs. They have some other things lined up for me where I'll be able to go out and start breaking more ground and showing that we women are we'll make you money. I mean, it's, sure. it's ridiculous, yeah, right? Course. It's ridiculous that we only have this tiny little... Uh, uh, you know, only 18% of directors. I mean, they talk about like Catherine Hardwick, who was like one of the highest grossing, you know, filmmakers, and she couldn't get a second film, right? Yeah, no, that, that's been a big topic of conversation here on just on this studio. So, of course, it's I'm very excited, and I've heard it being whispered all over the festival as well. That's fantastic. Thank Catherine you for Hardwick, taking yeah. the time to do that. It's really yeah, important no, that we course, hear this course. story. Thank you. Um, we need, I need your support. We need your support. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So your company is based in Santa Monica, California. That's correct. Which is exciting for me because I live down the street. Um, but I would like to know if you could pull back the curtain or help us peek around the corner into what might be next for you and the company. Is there anything that we, we should be paying attention to? So um, one of the exciting things we're going to do with our web VR platform, Reach, is um, we're working on turning it into a web AR platform so that you can do it either which way. If you mm. decide AR is your focus, you're welcome to use the platform for the same content creation and distribution. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, I'm also working on a really, really beautiful piece with the Japanese American National Museum about a kid named Stanley Hayami who was uh, incarcerated in those concentration camps where we put Japanese Americans. And mm. he created this beautiful diary with drawings um, uh, that we're working on doing some extraordinary animations with. And um, uh, that'll premiere this uh, next fall. Um, and um, uh, we've got another couple of jobs I can't talk about. <laughs> of course, couple, right? A couple of those NDA <laughs> Of things. course, of course, of course. Uh, well, that's still very exciting. Uh, and so people can see this work at emblematic.com, uh, is that Emblematicgroup.com. Emblematicgroup.com. One day we'll get that emblematic.com. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's swatting Or just on EG, it. for Christ's sake. Go on. We're almost out of time, but um, VR versus AR, are they just going to be equally used moving forward, or is one going to beat out the other? Uh, you know, it's funny. I was doing AR back in 2010, and I got like people were like QR codes and every day when I'm on that bird. I'm using my QR code <laughs> to unlock my bird, right? So, uh, you know, I, 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 it just makes me, you know, kind of laugh when people worry about that distinction. Mostly, when you make AR, 
or you make VR, you're using the same technologies. They're generally the same tools, right? And it's kind of like, am I going to export a doc or am I going to export a PDF? What are you going to do? And the goggles are going to become AR, VR goggles. are already moving in that direction where they are unified. Um, you know, when you look at people's glasses these days, when they go out into the sunlight, they just darken, right? We have those kind of technologies to ch turn the glasses into, uh, uh, make them that versatile, whether they're mm -hmm. AR glasses or VR glasses, right? And um, that's the future. That's a good place to leave it. That's the future. Thank you so much, Nani, for uh, dropping some knowledge on us today. I want to thank you for being here. This has been a wonderful conversation. And for those of you watching, we have a lot more in store for you today in the live studio, so you will definitely not want to miss out. You want to tune back in. At noon today, we have Lance Bass, formerly of NSYNC. He's an incredible person doing a lot of things in media. Um, he will be here at 1.30 p.m. And we'll have Kathy Griffin stopping by. And at, at uh, 3 p.m., Amanda Palmer will also be here. Our final live interview of the day will be at 4.30 p.m. with up-and-coming Australian singer-songwriter Angie McMahon. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and please continue to watch us here at southbysouthwest.com slash live.